So I don't know how we really start this. This is uh, <laughs> this is the first time we are trying to do one of these video episodes of the Creative Commons Prayer Podcast, and I'm here with um, some weirdo I found. I know. I don't know <laughs> where you picked me up. So uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Um, I'm Kristen Saylor. I'm his wife, among many other credentials that I have. I'm also an Episcopal priest, and I am excited to be interviewed for my first podcast. All right. So we're making this video to put uh, to put out online, uh, and we'll have a edited down version of our conversation in the usual uh, podcast feed for Creative Commons Prayer. We haven't done a conversation about prayer rather than a piece of prayer per se, but I think I'd like now and then to, to give that a try and see how it goes. So uh, I couldn't think of a better person to ask than, than my wife, Kristen, who with respect to prayer, I'd say has been on of a journey. Yes, that is certainly true. Um, I have spent a long time feeling very inadequate about my prayer life and feeling like I'm always looking over my shoulder at what my peers are doing and marveling at people who fall into traditional prayer patterns and just pray the office every day or can find 20 minutes in the morning for contemplative prayer. And I've just been marveling at them. And with with kind of a mix of respect and confusion because that has never been how I have prayed naturally or how I have wanted to pray. Um, and I felt that the church in some respects wants people to pray like that and doesn't leave a lot of room for patterns of prayer that look different. So um, the journey I've been on has been uh, reluctant and kind of accidental, I think. Um, but it's led me to some really interesting places in terms of expanding my definition of what counts as prayer, what prayer looks like, and what is a healthy prayer life for me. Yeah, so say more about, uh, we, we talk about that question a lot and um, have gotten it from, I think, several friends and mentors over the years. But how do we, how do we tackle this, this question of like, what counts as, as prayer? Well, I think it comes from a general mindset um, that we're stuck in, in this society of, um, that our worth as human beings depends on doing more and achieving more measurable progress and checking off boxes. Mm. And, um, it, just this general idea that something has to fit into a definition for it to count, be it about prayer or ministry goals or health or really anything. So if we want to check the box, it's got to be in a box. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Yeah, so I think it's been more about divesting myself from the paradigm of things needing to count, and that, uh, I haven't achieved that by any means, but um, I've been on that road for, God, about 10 years since my first spiritual director pointed out, well, maybe maybe your definition of prayer is too narrow, Kristen. Cool. So, so tell us about some of what you've been doing um, as you've learned to broaden that conception. Well, so in the very early conversations when I was first introduced to this project, um, it was because I was training for a triathlon at the time, which ironically I'm doing again now. Um, and I just kept telling my spiritual director then, like, all I want to do is run and swim. And I feel like that is feeding me more than the hours I'm spending with my nose in the prayer book trying to make myself pray Compline at night. And, and he just very sensibly pointed out to me and said, OK, so pray in the pool. And it was just this mind-blowing revelation for me that I could pray with my body. And I feel like when the church talks about praying with your body, they mean, well, it's like sometimes we kneel in the liturgy and sometimes we stand and we do pew aerobics and that's what praying with your body means. And that's ridiculous. It's so much more than that. And just the thought that I could pray more fluently and more easily if I did something very physical that could sort of distract my thinking brain and get it to turn off has helped me create more space for God. So movement prayer, very broadly defined, has sort of been my gateway into wildly untraditional prayer practices, um, from running and swimming to yoga to weightlifting. Um, I have a very robust and vibrant relationship with God at the gym, on the running trail, wherever I am. Mm -hmm. and I like what you said about like the activity itself being the thing that um, 
By the way, I can hear an airplane going over. <laughs> um, we live in the Bronx. It's loud. <laughs> We're working on trying to figure out how to make the airplane noise uh, mm-hmm. not be there. Yet another reason why silent prayer does not work here. <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, so I like what you said that, um, you know, the the action of, of embodying these physical practices, you know, sports, um, you know, body prayer, however you want to sort of talk about it, kind of lets your brain um, focus in a way that sort of takes out all the thoughts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think like that resonates really strongly with some of the the reading that I've done about things like centering prayer, you know, right? Like, it's, 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 um, I don't want to say reassuring, but maybe it's it's not surprising to me Mm -hmm. that, that, in some ways we're looking at different means for the same end. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to prayer. And that the church has just really confined itself to a very narrow definition of what it should look like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So besides the advice of this uh, kind and wise spiritual director, what, what sort of drew you into, uh, to this, this world of, I don't want to call them, what do we call them? I don't want to call them like alternative spiritual practices. I don't know what we call them. Okay. We'll keep working on that. (laughs) Whatever they're called, what, what, what drew you to this? I never got up in the morning and said, gosh, I would like to go find some alternative prayer practices. (laughs) I just sort of lived my life and did things and along the way realized, oh shoot, I think I'm praying. Huh? Well, that's interesting. What do I do with that? Mm. Um, it was never systematic. It was just stumbled across by accident. And um, to me, there's something lovely about that because it suggests praying with your whole life and that you know your prayer life isn't just limited to the 10 minutes you spend praying traditionally in the morning, but it's something that you carry with you mm-hmm. all day. And then that sort of opens up the possibility that everything is available for prayer. Mm-hmm. 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 But what drew me? I mean, deep dissatisfaction and feeling like I was just going through the motions when I was saying the office or trying to be silent, which is a disaster for me and it's never worked. And feeling like there had to be something more. And eventually I kind of by necessity started being more open to mm-hmm. God in surprising places and forms. Yeah, yeah. So tell me, um, tell me specifically about breath work because this is a practice that I have seen really (laughs) change many things about, about you. Yeah. And, and it's also a, a vibrant community Mm -hmm. in a way that I don't think I fully had my head around until you started telling me about what you were up to on Friday nights. Yeah. (laughs) So this is another perfect example of how I stumble into weird prayer practices by accident. Um, I found breath work and I'll tell you what it is in a second. Um, because I have struggled with insomnia for my whole life and about eight months ago was really in a bad period and was just kind of desperate and was digging deep in the archives of like wellness social media and I found this article that described breath work and I didn't know any more than you do just from me saying that word as and I quote, the last house on the block for desperate people looking to change things in their lives. And I was like, okay, that's great. Like, I live in New York City. It has to exist. And I booked an appointment with this healer in Brooklyn, having, like, truly no idea what I was signing up for, except I was like, please, God, let it make me sleep, because I am losing my mind. And I went to this session and was just blown away by how spiritual it was. I was in no way expecting to have a spiritual experience in this. Thinking more like like what it would feel like to be a, at a doctor's office. Yeah, I was expecting it to be like acupuncture mm-hmm. or something. Mm-hmm. You know, like something was going to be done to me and then I was going to... Sl- no, mm-hmm. not at all. Um, and I was just introduced to this, to this beautiful practice that is really you healing yourself and uniting mind and body and spirit in ways that in all my training as a priest, I have never been taught to do. I didn't even know this was available. And I'm lying on this massage table in this Brooklyn healing den, breathing, doing nothing but breathing. And I, oh my God, like I don't even have the words to describe what happened all this time later, but God was so present. 
And I walked out of there and was like, well, <laughs> like, that's not what I expected to happen. I'm like, now what do I do with this experience? Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I wasn't, ex- I didn't think I was showing up to pray. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. And so what's your, what's your, so from that initial experience, what's the trajectory been? So that initial experience pretty successfully blew my mind. And I had this real divided urge. Part of me wanted to tell everyone about it. And part of me just like really wanted to keep it for myself and continue to process it internally because I knew that something huge had happened. Like some internal door had opened to this whole part of me that I had never even known existed. And I'm still, as you can see, trying to find words for that. But so I sort of sat on that experience for a couple months and then um, had a really moving Lent. And sort of at the end of that process of really just taking time and creating space for God and going off social media entirely, which was crucial in making space, um, decided I needed another session with a different healer. And... And then we were cooking with gas. Like, at that time, I had an even stronger experience of the spirit. Like, really, like, physical experience of God entering my body. And then I started doing this practice at home. I started regularly going to breathwork groups. um, Because you can do it either individually or in a group or at home. There's so many ways you can do this. And then pretty soon thereafter, I... You know what? I can only say the words I received a call because there is no other way to say it to go to breathwork teacher training, which was never on the agenda back in February when I just wanted to sleep. (laughs) Never. So now I am certified as a breathwork healer, which is crazy. Mm. So many kinds of crazy and so cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, So I was you know, you talk about going to teacher training Mm -hmm. and between going to group sessions and going to this training along the line, some people have found out that you're a priest. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Um, and it sounds like they've been open to it. What's, what's it been like? Um, how have you sort of, um, embodied, uh, Uh I guess would be a good word, especially in this context. How have you embodied your identity as a religious leader in this presumably quite secular Mm -hmm. space with fear and trembling (laughs) so i have just been blown away throughout this journey of like kyle said how open this this journey this community is to my very by their definitions traditional priesthood i don't think my priesthood is traditional but to them it's like oh god an ambassador of the institutional church um from the beginning when I did private sessions, both healers I worked with were so open to it. And in both cases actually expressed relief of, oh, thank God, like I don't have to convince you of the necessity of believing in a higher power. Hmm. And they I- They use that I, word necessity? Yes, hmm. yeah. It's hmm. more and more of, of sort of the alternative healing community is really, stressing the need to believe in something bigger and trying to expand the language around that. So you'll go to a breathwork circle and someone will say, you know, I just want you to connect to your higher power. Maybe it's your grandmother's ghost. Maybe it's your spirit animal. Maybe it's the tree outside your apartment. And I'm like, well, can it just be God? Like, (laughs) why are we putting so many words around this? Uh But, um, so they're being careful not to say God. Yes. But you're... but they will with me, like yeah. in a private session. They're like, oh, oh, we can just say God. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. And 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 your experience is that that many of the people you're interacting with mm-hmm. are intrigued by that yeah. framing. Yeah, I really held that closely at first, and then it was actually in a group where my teacher, of course, who was leading it, knew I was a priest. And the theme of the group was faith and trust, which I didn't even know what that meant going in, but it was definitely faith and trust in God, like veiled. Mm. And at some point she just outed me in front of like these 40 Brooklynites and sitting in a circle in this dark candlelit room and was like, Kristen, tell us what you do for a living and who is God to you? And (laughs) I nearly peed my pants. Uh. I was so nervous. Mm. And I babbled something completely unintelligible, or so I thought. And then afterward, I had people coming up to me and asking me to go out to coffee to talk mm. about mm. religion and mm. God. And it was, it was, that was a turning point for me because it made me realize, like, that fear is mine. Like, mm. this community is so open and 
both the church and let's call it the breathwork community have so much to learn from each other mm. and their needs not being met in both directions. And yeah. perhaps that's my vocation to build a bridge between them. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you showed up looking for an insomnia fix. Yeah. You found a prayer practice and a healing practice mm -hmm. for yourself. And, and as you've um, continued to go deeper in this, you found yourself um, playing a leadership role, both mm -hmm. as someone who's gotten training and um, as someone who's interacting with people who are very open to your identity as a, as a religious leader. Mm -hmm. um, in some ways, you've walked into a, a sort of opportunity for, it sounds like, low-key evangelism. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> God, yes. On top of all this. Well, I think in so many circumstances, especially in New York City, like the biggest act of evangelism you can do is to be an ambassador of the institutional church. And I mean, my gender works in my favor in this case, because they're like, oh, wait, you're a girl priest? The church, the church lets that happen? And, you know, you dig a little deeper and you talk about, you know, issues of sexuality and gender, and you can pretty quickly say, like, the church doesn't always suck. Mm. on these things and that alone once you've established mm. that you're not a misogynist yeah gay hater like yeah. th you know yeah then people will start to listen to you yeah yeah it's powerful yeah uh, i have similar experiences in my you know secular doctoral program yeah, I bet. um just uh having people sort of come out of the work work woodwork and tell me about their religious experiences mm -hmm. and many of them uh negative in the institutional yes. sense yes and um a lot of healing yes <laughs> needing to happen very there. very much so yeah well as we move toward wrapping up and as we start to think about the connection between these prayer practices and um and your role as a, as a faith leader mm -hmm. um what would you say the church can and should learn from this experience and from these practices you started to nod to that before and also maybe what shouldn't the church um, take from mm -hmm. take from experiences like yours. So the first time I went to one of these groups, which are always on Friday nights, usually in like deep Brooklyn somewhere, um, I had this very strong sense of, oh my God, the church is wondering where its people are. Like they're all here, <laughs> they're all right here. All these people who are looking for a spiritual experience and are have either been wounded by the institutional church or just weren't raised in it and don't know what it is they're seeking alternative ways of connecting to God and finding community. Mm -hmm. And more and more, especially in New York City right now, those things exist. Mm. And they're beautiful and non-judgmental and true community, true friendship is opening up out of them. Mm. And the church has so much to learn from that. I would tell every priest who is lamenting in New York City, at least, yeah. who is lamenting where his or her people are, go to a breathwork circle, go to a sound bath. Mm. You know, find the alternative healers in your community and see what kind of community they are building and then see what you can learn from that. Invite them in. Mm. You know, identify what are the needs being met here and how could my community meet them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So maybe not everyone needs to go and get teacher training. Oh God, no. Um, but uh, but being a hospitable maybe site of some of this work, um, building some relationships, that sort of thing. Yeah, opening up conversations. Um, and I don't know what this actually looks like on the ground yet. Like I, sure. I'm not certified to lead groups mm -hmm, yet, mm -hmm. but I think there's great potential um, to do this work in houses of worship. I mean, the, the basic language is completely compatible with Christianity. Mm. Um, and I think there's really interesting potentials for cross-pollination that mm. I'm just beginning to think about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I also think this is, let me try this out. Um, I also think that, and part of the goal of this, of this little website is to try to hold a space for the idea that, um, that prayer is broader than, mm -hmm. um, than we think. And, you know, little things that we can do about that, just like in the pulpit and mm -hmm. um, in Bible study and, and whatever, to, to sort of hold up for people. It's okay if sitting with a prayer book and reading the daily office is not your jam. Mm -hmm. Like, but what, but where I don't want to let you off the hook is finding the thing that right. is your jam, exactly. you know, like wh where, where can you, um, 
where can you meet God in a simple, straightforward way? And right. maybe that's through making memes on social media. Right. And maybe that's through breath work. But if we don't broaden the scope of what counts, mm-hmm. then we're giving people, well, you can pray the daily office, you can be in silence, you can walk a labyrinth, mm-hmm. you know, here are your four things and pick one. Yeah. Instead yeah. of here's the whole world that God created and God is everywhere. Mm-hmm. Find something, be super creative. Yeah. Yeah, and trusting, I think, that as as our spiritual lives deepen, we'll seek out a breadth and a balance that might, um, you know, for many of us, and, and not all of us, include other kinds of things, including more traditional things, of you course, know, like yeah. as community gets built, um, you know, people become open to hearing about what works for others, right. and, you know, like interesting things happen. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing this. Thank you. Um, anything, anything you want to say? Do you want to, you want to pitch your coming soon website? <laughs> so um, I found this guy on the street to build me a website. <laughs> Just no idea where I got him. Um, yeah, I have found that people within the church are asking me for breathwork sessions, and people in the breathwork community are asking me for sermons. So I'm trying to um, create a website that represents both facets of my identity and tries to bridge them. So watch for that. And um, if you're interested in a session in person or remotely, hit me up. Cool. All right. KristenSailor.com, right? Yes. Is that right? Yes. All right. Um, Cool. Well, thanks for joining us on this episode of the Creative Commons Prayer podcast. We'll see how this uh, interview gets turned into uh, a bit of audio for the the feed. But in the meantime, I'm Kyle Oliver reminding you that every prayer is a remix. See you next time. Cool. Mm. You should put that in the video. What's up? You should put the kiss in the video. I will.